Thank you so much for your hospitality, and uh, let me associate myself with so much of what you had to say. I thought it was very, very insightful. I should, in making a full disclosure, tell you that I have neither the erudition, experience, or background that the ambassador has, and that when I was asked by Mark to, uh, to come here and to speak to this group, I must tell you that I had not heard the term cultural diplomacy. I really wasn't quite sure what that was. Uh, and so you must be saying, why in heaven's sakes would this old fellow be invited to share anything with you with that kind of a lack of knowledge and background? And let me suggest without being immodest or presumptuous, I'm probably the kind of guy that needs to be engaged because I've traveled fairly widely, been to more than 40 countries, have been to Bulgaria and spent some time in Sofia. Uh, I've been to the Crimea, uh, and I've been to many, many countries in the world. I have a great interest in history, a passion for it, and I love things uh, internationally. And so perhaps the kind of an American that I am needs to be included in this kind of let me suggest that because one is widely traveled does not necessarily mean one is knowledgeable about the cultural issues in a country. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I went to Waterloo. Many of you know that that was where Wellington uh, defeated Napoleon in a climactic battle of the war that had uh, engulfed uh, Europe for, for many decades. And I can tell you where the Imperial Guard falls and how Blucher came back uh, in the nick of time to, present, to prevent, in effect, Napoleon from breaking Wellington's lines. But until I spent an hour the afternoon after my visit there with a uh, citizen of Belgium, I had no idea that there were cultural divisions in that country that were, in effect, presenting what I would call centrifugal forces that may, hopefully not, break up the country. And so, although I am not as knowledgeable, certainly, as the ambassador, let me, as American lawyers says, say, let me stipulate that, I agree, the importance of establishing cultural bridges, the importance uh, for my country in terms of our national security and our economy, and I find myself in agreement with the insightful uh, observations that the ambassador has made. I think in terms of understanding the American perspective without necessarily agreeing with it, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. was one of the most distinguished justices ever to grace the United States Supreme Court. And nearly a hundred years ago, he made the observation that a page of history is sometimes more instructive than a volume of logic. A page of history. So let me share a little bit of our history in terms of how we historically relate and some of the attitudes. Uh, you know, America fought its war of independence, and our iconic uh, national hero, the founder of our country, George Washington, who frequently had to make a decision between Alexander Hamilton, our first Secretary of Treasury, and Jefferson. Jefferson urged us to get involved with the French Revolution. Uh, Washington declined to do so, and in his farewell address to the nation, he said, beware of foreign entangling alliances. In effect, look, the problems of Europe ought not to be our problems. And for a century, for most of the 19th century, America focused on its internal development, spreading to the West and developing the West and creating an economy which ultimately became the largest economy in the world. Uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century, we did begin to become more assertive globally. Uh, the Spanish-American War, the acquisition of the Philippines for a short time Cuba. But that really wasn't based upon any cultural understanding. The Filipinos thought we had come to liberate their country from Spain. In point of fact, we did not exactly liberate the country, and we fought uh, an insurrection by Aguinaldo, one of the great uh, Philippine uh, uh, heroes. And then in the century move into the new century, we uh, were very reluctant to get involved in World War I, and ultimately we did so, as you know. And then after the 
the war, there was a kind of a period of disillusionment. This was the war, to use the American terminology of our President Woodrow Wilson, the war to end all wars. And yet the United States refused to ratify uh, the treaty which established the League of Nations. That is, in effect, let's kind of retreat from this experience in Europe and kind of, and well into the period before World War II, there was a strong isolationist feeling. Franklin Roosevelt did an extraordinary job of ultimately moving us in a position where we're able to participate with the Allies uh, to defeat the forces uh, of aggression. And although Americans are very diverse, we love to say that we are the melting pot, perhaps more appropriately, uh, the quilt in which many different cultures, we've not always embraced those cultures, at least initially. When the Irish came to America after the, the Irish famine in the middle part of the 19th century, there was tremendous hostility and prejudice to the Irish. In fact, some of the terminology that's still part of the American lexicon, you know, a paddy wagon. That's where the drunken Irish were taken to the police station. And we still use the term paddy wagon, not today with reference to the Irish. We talk about a Donnybrook, that's a fight. That's reference to the Irish, the stereotypical that they were drunken fighting folks all the time. The Chinese faced a tremendous hostility, uh, Chinese exclusion laws, I mean, in other cultures. And so that is part of our history and it's still as the history of every country influences attitudes. I think America is oftentimes misperceived. I mean, uh, the social media, the, uh, the way in which we are depicted in films, I mean, oftentimes I think presents one of the least attractive sides of our country. That is, we are a country of enormous wealth, uh, we are a country that tells the rest of the world we know what's best. You know, if you really want to correct the problems that you have at home, just follow us. Do, do what we've done. We, we've got the answer. And in the 1950s, long before many of you were even born, it was kind of the ugly American. You know, we went to countries around the world, kind of asserted ourselves in a very clumsy and awkward way. And, and some of that may be to give Americans at least some benefit, or a colloquial term, cutting us some slack, as we say, is that our country is so large that you can travel 2,500 miles across country, and essentially it is an English-speaking community, whereas particularly in Europe, if you travel, you would go through many, many different countries, many languages, uh, many different uh, cultures. In fact, even in the recent times, one of the chairmen of the uh, Center of Foreign Services, the Foreign Relations Committee, prided himself, I've never had a passport. This is the chairman of the Center of Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and so we, we have that as part of our, of our background. Our educational system really does not do justice to cultural diplomacy, as I have come to understand that term. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have had the benefit of a university education and perhaps a little bit more about that can tell you a lot about the history of various countries from the perspective of the great uh, alliances, the struggles, the incredible architectural legacy that's left from some of the ancient cultures and up to the present day. But we really know very little about the culture. As one who knows a little bit about the country, I know a little bit about the Battle of Tours, 732. That's when the Islamic advance, which threatened to engulf all of Northern Europe, was stopped by the Frankish king, Charles Martel. And it took, uh, from a European perspective, 700 years before finally the Muslims, you know, in 1492, the year, as we say in America, that America was discovered for that to occur. And yet, I must tell you, until recent times, I had no idea that there was such a division and an antagonism and a historical enmity, Shia to Sunni. Never heard that. Never heard that. And I'm, again, not a scholar, but I know a fair amount about history. Had absolutely no idea. And uh, 
when the breakup of Yugoslavia occurred, had no idea that these historical uh, cultural groups had such intense animosity, the Serb, the Croat, the Muslim. I thought that was a vestige of something that occurred hundreds of years ago. So that's something that came. And obviously the tribalism in Africa that we're experiencing today. The great cultural divide with respect to religion is, is challenging for us. We have a constitutional provision in America, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, in which people can say terrible things about the Catholic Church, or I'm an Episcopalian, or we have many Mormons in our part of the world. The idea that somehow blasphemy would be considered a crime and punishable is just anathema. We don't understand that, and that's troublesome to us. So. You know, when the fatwa was directed against uh, Salman Rushdie, you know, and the word was out, you must, to be a good Muslim, kill this individual, whether we agreed with what he said or not. I frankly have never read any of the satirical verses, so I don't know exactly, but what he said must have been pretty bad. That becomes very much of a cultural divide. Religion is sensitive in America, and in polite circles, when you're talking socially, you very seldom bring up religion. That's just, it's considered personal. Part of that's my own background. I'm an Episcopalian. We do a lousy job of proselytizing. There are today more Muslims in America than there are Episcopalians. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable. I mean, if you're religious, that's wonderful. Frankly, I go to church on a regular basis. That certainly does not make me uh, a, certainly a, any better person than anyone who does not, but I do have a strong belief. And now the United States is facing this budget crisis, and I think the observation that the ambassador made is, uh, is a correct one. So there's kind of a tendency at this point to say, wait a minute, all of these foreign policy engagement and the billions of dollars we've spent for this and that, presumably to provide aid to more recently Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, incomplete and perhaps in many ways uh, not the correct way approach, has kind of left us with the sense that, wait a minute, maybe this really isn't worth it. Maybe this isn't worth it. And again, I'm not suggesting that our efforts were perfect, but at least I think the intention was to provide stability to the world. So in, in America, if you ask about uh, the budget, where, where should we cut? Ah, I've got the answer, foreign aid. I must tell you that that probably represents one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget, but yet that's a category that in America, and I think the ambassador probably has heard that, that's where we could balance the budget. That's not true even if we eliminated all foreign aid, which I don't. And then there is what I think is, is one of our more unpleasant features, and that is having been to various parts of the world, there are many things that other parts of the world do that's better than, boy, that is sensitive politically, very sensitive. I don't know how any fair-minded person could not go to Europe and admire the extraordinary rail system that exists in Europe. Far better. But if you pursue that line frequently, the response will be, and largely from people who are not unsophisticated perhaps, well, if it's so great there, why don't you go there and live as if, wait a minute, somehow your identity is an American, your patriotism is, is, is challenged because you find something in another country to be admired. Uh, our own president, uh, trying to re-engage Europe early in his term, was accused politically of making an apology for America. I never saw it that way. Uh, I thought what his attempt to do was to be more inclusive, to start to say, look, we want to work with you. We want to uh, embrace uh, uh, your own country as we try to deal with these issues, which the ambassador has pointed out. Not terribly well. So we're not perceived uh, as we see ourselves. You know, the Scottish poet Bobby Burns once said, would the God give us the will to see ourselves as others see us? That's not just true in countries. That's true of each other. How are we perceived you know, as individuals and, and countries? And sometimes we fail uh, to see that. So that's enough of our history. Where, where, do we, where do we go from here? And what 
attributes do we bring to the table in terms of building those cultural bridges? Well, you know, right after World War II, back in 1946, the Fulbright programs to help Americans. That, that's a wonderful, wonderful program. When I was in high school, the American Field Service, I had a program where each summer a couple of high school students would be sent you know, to Europe to live with European families, you know, much as a son or a daughter would do. And we had a reciprocal. We had, in my time, I can tell you the name of our, of our forum. We had Paul Gunther Zoller from Germany, and my graduating class, Guy Withoff from Belgium, and Horst Schmidt from Germany. Now, that should have made me a more enlightened, sensitive person. I never, ever had a conversation with any of these three about the culture of their community. In other words, they were there. I think they kind of absorbed our culture, the, the good, the, the not so good, and that which they might not agree with at all. But I really didn't, and, and I was fairly active. I was not, uh, you know, some recluse that uh, went to school and left. Uh, I, I was engaged accurately. Uh, we have a number of wonderful study programs today. In fact, many, many students in America, some of you may be part of this, have in effect studied abroad for a semester where you're not just a tourist. I, I, I'm highly supportive of tourism, but as I've cited my own self, having been to a lot of these countries, I know far less about their culture. I can sure tell you a little bit about their history. I've, Admire that magnificent statue of the Tsar Liberator and Sophia. Know a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I do. But, but that just, just a tad, just a tad. I mean, don't, I don't think I begin to, to, to know enough to talk intelligently about your country. But my point being, you've got, we've got the Peace Corps. And, and there are, are, are people that have spent, not necessarily in the glamour capitals of the world, but some of the most impoverished, destitute parts of the world have spent a couple of years of their life. That is a very positive thing, and that kind of brings out what I'd like to think is about the best uh, of America. We have a lot of what I would call NGOs, or maybe a better term for it, that is organizations who go to help countries that are experiencing floods as uh, uh, the ambassador's country in Varna today and other types of natural disasters, and, and that's a very one. And I must say, having traveled when I was the vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee to many parts of the world with our embassy staff and what we call as the country club, where you get to meet young people who are part of our foreign service, I don't know a more dedicated, uh, idealistic, group of young people in the world. I was so impressed. And we went to a lot of areas. We're not talking about the ambassador to the court of St. James in England or the ambassador to France or Germany or Italy. We're talking areas in the world in which there are young families where there are no physicians available within maybe 50 or 100 miles. I think that uh, the increasing diversity of our country, I think, are assets to bring to bear. We are becoming much more diverse in our society. Uh, the means by which we communicate, the, the internet, much more connected. There is a paradox that I see in America that is somewhat troubling. Never before in the history of civilization have we had more information available in this little cell phone that I have. Never before. Never before. The computer that guided the Apollo mission 45 years ago to the landing on the moon was probably half the size of this today. And yet at a time when more information is available to us, I'm not sure we are better educated and better knowledgeable. That's a real paradox that I see. Uh, I think there is a growing awareness, which I think is positive, and that is there is a recognition in the business community from their own self-interest, and I don't suggest to you that that is unique in America. Obviously, every country has its own self-interest. That's certainly part of uh, advocating on behalf uh, of your country, just as the ambassador does so effectively here in Washington. 
and the business community recognizes that the real growth potential in the world are foreign markets. Sometimes we stumble badly because of our cultural insensitivity. Sometimes the translations in which we market American products are unbelievably insensitive. Not because we designed it that way, no business person in his or her right mind, but, but because we don't understand some of the cultural nuances and we have stumbled badly. I'm talking about some of the major corporations in America. So I do not want to conclude this on a negative note. There's great opportunity, and again, to reaffirm my personal sense that most Americans, I think, probably share the view that we need to work together in a global community to try to achieve, you know, peace, the right of individual societies to make uh, decisions for themselves, to encourage tolerance, where, whether it's religion or whether it's cultural or political or economic differences. And yet we face, as the ambassador pointed out, many challenges. Very, very troubling, certainly from my perspective, is, is Putin's aggression in the Crimea very discouraging, although maybe more understandable, what we've seen in Iraq. I did not favor us going into Iraq, but we have spent more than a trillion dollars, thousands of lives lost, tens of thousands of Americans suffer from injuries as a result of that, and to see this kind of implode before our eyes, we probably did not see all of this as clearly as we should have. And in my view, uh, Maliki is simply not doing what the ambassador has suggested when I think inclusion. I mean, obviously, in effect, what he did is to, in effect, include only, only, only uh, uh, people that shared his uh, perspective and uh, dealt very harshly with, with uh, uh, a population that allies itself with Iran. So that's kind of how I see things, but we need to educate people. I, I think that's the first thing, and, and we're not necessarily real good at that, and we need to be more tolerant. One of the things that's troubling about American society is there's this polarization that exists. Today, on the left, if you're a Democrat, people on the far left, if you're right, people on the far right, and because those groups tend to be so organized, properly so, they have a disproportionate impact on the political party structure. Recently, for example, the, uh, uh, the majority leader in the United States Senate, Eric Cantor, was defeated. I mean, a, a shock to the political world. Now, allegedly, he was defeated because he had spoken about the need for inclusion, perhaps a path to citizenship. For Let me tell you, in a metaphor of the Old West, I don't think the Republican Party leadership will touch the immigration issue, which I think needs to be addressed, because the message is there, and it is a new word in the American political lexicon, primary. That is, if you get too close to the center, you are perceived by a small but a very, very active and effective minority in the party, you could lose the primary. And that is the lesson that many are drawing from Eric Cantor's defeat, because he had all of the establishment with him, probably had 20 times as much money to spend. Those are not favorable. Having said that, I believe most people in America really have a more moderate view. When you Take a poll of people in, in the United States. Most people believe we need to address our immigration problems with comprehensive reform. But when you take various political constituencies, congressional districts, as they are called in America, they have been so uh, balkanized, gerrymandered is an, uh, an American political term, where in congressional district one, two, or three, uh, they're so overwhelmingly Democrat or Republican they tend to take the more extreme rather than the moderate view, whereas if you take the overall view of America, it's much more moderate. Just as I suspect that in the, in the world of Islam, there are more moderates. I like to believe that. I think that's true. My own personal physician 
is a Muslim. I know him and, and many people uh, uh, who have come from uh, countries uh, such as, as he did, from Pakistan, and I know that him to be a Muslim, but that's not the face that we see all too often of Islam. We see the radicalization, which makes Americans very fearful and frightful. So I don't have any answers. I'll refer you back to the uh, ambassador's 9, 10, or 11 checkpoint she gave us and say that I associate with those. And I'd be happy to open those up for any questions, Mark, fair, unfair on this topic, or anything that you think is relevant to this group. Thank you so much for including me here today. It's a delight to be here to meet the ambassador, to hear her, and to uh, hopefully respond to some of your questions. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. I think uh, awareness of these issues, I think young people need to be more aware of these issues. My sense is that a lot of, uh, of, of uh, American students that go on to the university are certainly much more aware of that. But the linkage between what's happening in the world and knowing about other cultures, that's a link that's not clearly established. I happen to believe it, but I'm just the antithesis of that young person. You know, I'm an old person. I'm a septuagenarian, you know. I mean, the world is about you and not me. My time has come and passed, and I've certainly enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience I've had in my lifetime, but the future is about young people like yourself. So I think an awareness is, got, is, is the first link. The one strength of the American political system is it does provide access. That is to say, for young people who are involved, there's all kinds of a way to do so. If your interest is in the political process, most every political office holder candidate that I've known welcomes young people as part of the campaign. Uh, there are, and I think a wonderful thing in the United States Congress, there are internships, in other words, where you bring in college students typically, you know, to come during the summer, you know, to kind of learn. I think it's a wonderful experience. My two daughters did that, and I think that they greatly benefited. Those are wonderful opportunities. And so, although political access is still important. I mean, I hate to say it, but there is some truth to, it's not what you know, but who you know. Uh, that, there, there's truth to that. Uh, I know, for example, my, I was having trouble getting a doctor's appointment, you know. My doctor, who's very politically active, is Icon. Uh, Ike, can you get me an appointment? I got it the next day. Now, would that have happened to the average person? No. And so, is that unfair? Absolutely unfair. Because my situation was not critical. I just wanted to get this appointment and get it over with. So there, there's some truth to that. But there is access, and you can start. And that's how many people become active politically, is, is that they that they intern in, in, in various political, the Congressional Senate offices, they intern in the governor's office, they participate. Uh, and, and, and there is, I think, a welcoming atmosphere because most folks, you know, politicians are fairly good at math. And they see you and they say, wait a minute, more likely that that young woman will be around the next time up for re-election than this guy here. <laughs> well, l let me... Let me try. I don't have the Rosetta Stone as far as the answer in terms of what it should be. Uh, I do think we have to be inclusive. The difficulty is sitting down talking to those who have sworn to kill you. That is hard. That is very, very hard to do, you know. I mean, uh, but yet I think clearly that the solution ultimately has to be a political one and there needs to be some dialogue, so I do favor that. Quite frankly, in America, whether we handled everything the right way, I'm not here to defend everything we've done. I've got to say that I think our intentions were honorable. We were trying to, in effect, provide an opportunity for the Afghan people to make decisions themselves. I mean, to allow young women to be educated. You know the story there. Uh, uh, so I think we are honorable. But I think after, well, this is the longest war, we call it that, 
in the history of our country. And so there is real fatigue, a sense somehow that notwithstanding our efforts, maybe imperfectly executed, that listen, we're not in a position to say that we're a whole lot better off than we were before we went in some 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, part of what we hear in the country is the political leadership in Afghanistan is corrupt. We hear that, that it does not enjoy the popular support of the people. That's an issue that you can. I can recall being very old and not having read as much history, but knowing a lot about it simply because I'm an old guy. I remember after World War II when the Chinese communists defeated the nationalist government. In America, the hue and cry was, who lost China? I hear echoes of that today. Who lost Iraq? In point of fact, America didn't lose China to the communist cause. In effect, the government of Chiang Kai-shek, the Kuomintang, no longer, for whatever reason, probably corruption and a whole other, no longer enjoyed the support of the Chinese people. There was no way that was going to prevail. Don't happen to support the ideology or the belief of the Chinese government. I've been there many years ago to China. But without the support of the public in those countries, our efforts, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan, as they were in China, are doomed to failure, in my view. That's not a great answer, but I think that's about as close as I can come. Please. Well, let, let me try to respond to that. I think there is not much truth to what you have to say, that many things are, are much better than they were before. I think one of uh, the problems that sometimes we face in America is that our attention span is somewhat limited. It is kind of part of the American social fabric, particularly in the generation that we're a part of instant gratification. We have that talk, that young woman back there, her generation, from the perspective of those of older that this instant gratification is, look, you know, I want my, an iPhone today. Uh, for a newlywed couple, look, we've got to have all the furniture today. Where there was, I think, a little more in the past, the idea that, look, you have to wait and see. So the culture has become more akin to instant gratification. It's a cultural change. There is some parallel in the sense that, wait a minute, uh, we've done all of these things. We expect the result that you describe, which is certainly we all support, to occur today. And if it does not occur as quickly as we'd hope, then there is some frustration in the sense that, look, uh, it's not worth spending uh, uh, blood and treasure to continue. That's what you're really facing today. And these incidents that occur that are highly publicized where Afghan troops were trying to train have been infiltrated by those. And so some of the casualties that Americans have taken have come ostensibly from the, the very people that were trying to train to be capable of defending their country. Undoubtedly, they've been infiltrated by others who don't share those values. But that, that's kind of the frustration. Well, we've got a limitation in terms of, of our own economic power. There's a recognition today that, wait a minute, we can't do everything uh, everywhere in the world. And so that's kind of what you're fighting. Well, l let me say that I think the, the observation, the criticism, if you were, that we do not know as, as, as Americans as much about Africa as we should is a fair criticism. I think that's a fair. We know very little about Africa, and we certainly do not begin to comprehend some of the differences between you know, the cultures north of the Sahara and south of the Sahara. And we are, you know, I, I don't know. To tell you that I, when I studied history and geography as a grade school student during the 1940s, our textbook was organized by empire. The British Empire, the French Empire, the Belgian Empire. So those of us of my age, if we know anything historically, we've had difficulty. Now, wait a minute. What did northern Rhodesia and southern Rhodesia become? Now, what, what countries are those? I mean, probably some, most people had no idea that they had a previous name. Any map or globe that's 20, 30 years old needs to be replaced. And so we really know very little about that. So the criticism, the importance to our, of Africa to our country is not widely understood. So I think the criticism is, is fair. My sense, part of the 
rise of radicalism in the Middle East and Africa is based upon frustration. The young lady back there pointed out that, and particularly true in the Middle East and Africa, uh, the demographics very, very youthful, very youthful. And I think with many of those young people, it's my sense that they're frustrated. They don't see an opportunity. They don't see a chance for themselves. And I think they tend to be uh, attracted to the radicalism because those folks have got the answer. You take a highly sophisticated country like Germany, one of the most sophisticated, educated countries in the world. And in effect, Adolf Hitler was able to persuade that country that, look, your problem is with the Jews. Wait a minute. They, in effect, uh, were traitors to the, the German cause in World War I. And if we get rid of the Jews, everything's going to be all right. That's a very highly sophisticated education. And yet, he was able to make it cause and, in effect, lead his country and the world into a cataclysmic event. So it, th these frustrations, when ambitions and desires are not met, often lend themselves to radical cause. Maybe just one more question, because I know you've got to, 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 to take a break here. And this young lady here, or what? Okay, well, let me just say that there's certainly a recognition in the world that China is emerging as a world power. And they've become increasingly assertive in the region in the region, you know, whether we're talking about Japan or Korea or the Philippines. And that is of concern to those countries. It's of concern, obviously, to the United States. Uh, clearly, I think everybody in America recognizes that there's some value in these cultural exchanges. I think it's wonderful. The frustration and difficulty for us, as we see it, because China politically is a closed society. Uh, we wonder as supportive as I think most are, I'm certainly very supportive of that, will it make a difference? Will it make a difference in terms of the political uh, policies of the country? I hope so, but clearly these exchanges are very helpful, and there's much to admire about China. I mean, in our own way. I mean, you think of the oldest continuous culture maybe in civilization of what they brought to the world long before the West, you know? Whether you're talking about movable type, paper, gunpowder, go on and on and on. The Chinese had it long before we in the West, if, if you can include Europe as part of the West. So that's the concern and frustration I think that a lot of people have. Not that they're opposed to the cultural exchanges, uh, but what? What is that going to do in terms of a political power structure that monopolizes the country? And from our point of view, and I think it's fair to say, suppresses dissent. I mean, that's increasingly obvious. The internet, the whole, you, you know, you know more about that than I do. Last question, this gentleman, then I know I need to leave and you need to do more important things after I uh, leave. Please, sir. Well, I don't think I would disagree with you that we certainly need to do more to encourage U.S. involvement in terms of diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. I recognize that. I've been to Turkey. And, and, and the concern that I have, I mean, uh, you know, since uh, Kamal Ataturk, at least uh, the view that those of us that know just a smidgen about Turkey, that's less than little. That, that's my knowledge of Turkey. We embrace his call for a secular society. Yes. Uh, we support that. There is concern among those of us who have been there that, that Turkey is less secular today and that there is a rise of what I would call uh, a religious uh, bent that would in effect make Turkey less of a secular but more of a Muslim state as opposed to Muslim being the dominant. That's a real concern. And when you talk to many people in Turkey, not all, share that view that they see this drift in that direction. That's the concern we have because Turkey is kind of the anchor to the West. I mean, we need Turkey. Turkey is a NATO ally. It's a partner. Uh, we, we, we need them and we need to include them. But that's a concern. Finally, let me conclude, although certainly much 
criticism can be directed to the United States, and fairly so, in terms of how we've had certain, handled certain international relations. But what we desperately need to hear in America, and we don't hear much of it, and that may very well be the fault of our media, which we can, we need to hear those moderate voices. We need to hear the moderate voices of Islam. I don't think that Islam is a religion of hate, uh, personally, but that's the dominant, that, that's the impression that's created with all these surrounds. You pointed out rightly, it is hard for us to understand suicide bombers that are killing fellow Muslims. That is just so incomprehensible to us. But where are those moderates to speak out to condemn that? Not necessarily to support U.S. policy, but to say, wait a minute, that is wrong. That rejects uh, the teachings of Muhammad, at least as I understand them. Yeah. Correct. And uh, yeah. Right. That's an order. Suicide, there's yeah. no justification yeah. for suicide. There's no justification yeah. for killing innocent people. Well, we need to hear that. We need to hear that in America. We need to hear that in Turkey and other uh, you know, Islamic countries, that the moderate view is that this is not the word of the Quran as Muhammad would have given it uh, to the uh, Islamic world. And that's, we don't hear that enough. So that's kind of my criticism, where I certainly embrace fairly the criticism, it's often is directed and appropriately so to the United States, but we need to hear that so that Americans and others in the world will understand that this radicalism, this, uh, this uh, suicidal frenzy is not the way the great majority of Muslims in the world or in America believe it. And on that note, you're entitled to a break, and thank you for your patience. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you.